Germany's doing well and we're not. Well, the reason why they're doing well is arguably because they really worked hard to make changes. And what the U.S. can learn there is that we too could potentially do that. This is at Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, the German labor market miracle, and lessons for the U.S. economy. Millions of American workers have lost jobs in the Great Recession, and many are still struggling to find work. And the same holds true for other industrialized nations where unemployment remains high. But workers have fared better in Germany due to its labor market miracle, explains fellow Elizabeth Jacobs as she looks at the factors that made the difference. Tell me a little bit about uh, German labor market policy that, that helped them weather both the Great Recession and do better in the recovery than we're doing here in the U.S. German employers were far more likely to reduce their workers' hours and then hire them back full-time um, when, when the recession was done with and when demand really returned. Whereas in the U.S. we saw employers shed their workers um, and they just haven't really hired them back in the same way. So that was sort of the main difference in why the employment picture is so different in the two countries. And Elizabeth, you write that there are both private and public incentives that make it um, easier for employers to keep people on the job rather than laying them off. On the public side, and a lot of other people have pointed this out, Germany has this part of their unemployment insurance system called short-time compensation. Um, and it is what it sounds like, just to kind of parse it. The idea is compensating workers when their hours are reduced. And so firms can basically continue to pay their workers their normal salaries. That's actually a little bit of a reduced salary. And the unemployment system, in turn, will then compensate those, those firms. And so it incentivizes the firms to hold on to their workers. The system helps pay for their social insurance benefits, so things like health care and their retirement benefits. Um, those don't end up costing the firm in the way they might if they didn't get help from the, the government. And then there's also Germany's flexible working tool time kit. What is it? How does it work? Over the course of the last couple of decades, German employers working together with organized labor, which is a very big deal in Germany, and with the state have come up with this system of what I and some others have called this flexible working time toolkit, which is really an idea of incentivizing flexibility around hours in exchange for holding on to workers. And we don't do that in the same way in the U.S. Um, for a variety of reasons. We tend to shed workers as opposed to holding on to them. Um, and that's really made the difference um, between the two between the two countries is the way that both public and private incentives in Germany have helped employers hold on to their workers as opposed to let them go. Elizabeth, tell me about working time accounts, which is one of the things in this toolkit we're talking about. They're essentially like time banks. That's the way I like to think about it, that this is something that Germany's largely unionized workforce agreed to as a concession for, for some job security. And the idea is, will work overtime hours without demanding overtime pay so long as you bank those hours and you obviously you only work out overtime when time is good and demand is high and so you're banking hours and then in turn um, if you need to cut hours back rather than cutting my regular pay I'll get that pay back um, later when time times are bad. Now that's not it's not obvious why that would keep workers or keep employers from letting workers go the reason is sort of in the details of the contract employers have to pay those workers everything that's left in those accounts plus a severance if they were to fire those workers during downtimes. And so it really incentivizes things for the employer to hold on to those workers rather than let them go because it's cheaper. And again, in comparing the U.S. to Germany when it comes to the labor market, Germany tends to take a longer view of what's going on in its labor market and how things could impact it down the road. We don't do that. Their employers are, are much more coordinated, their unions are much more coordinated in terms of really developing this high skills workforce. And so employers have a real incentive to hold on to those employees because they've put real time and money and energy into making sure that those employees can deliver exactly what they need. We don't do that in the U.S. I mean, we really don't. We have a handful of you know, model employers who do do that. But for the most part, workforce development is the purview of the states, the counties, community colleges, it's kind of all over the place. So there's no real incentive to hold on to your workers because you can always hopefully find another one. Now I argue that that's actually a really, it's, it's short term thinking and in the long run we're paying for it um, because we're, it, firms have to pay for recruitment and retraining and all kinds of kind of hidden costs of, of using layoffs instead of reductions. But that long view in Germany is arguably what's helping their labor market perform better and I think it's also part of the key to their success. And all of this, Elizabeth, is pretty much an about-face for a country that was once known as the sick man of Europe. 
it was actually The Economist magazine who first called Germany the sick man of Europe, and that was because they had this economy that was going nowhere. They had high and growing unemployment, and it was really kind of a mess. Part of that was just 1980s, 1980s economic change and Germany really struggling to figure out how to make sense of that. And then they kind of had this double whammy when German unification happened, and they inherited essentially this whole other economy that had been in East Germany was now part of West Germany and they had to put the two together and that really sent the labor market into something of a tailspin. And over the course of the last couple of decades, the unions and employers and the German state have really kind of worked together to try and adapt to figure out a way to pick their economy up and make it work. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brooklyn's events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.